no further ado, Judge Basil, go ahead. All right, thank you. I don't normally do this, but since I'm in a slightly different crowd than usual, I want to do a quick poll beforehand to get an idea of relative comfort levels with SQL Server. So if you're really, really comfortable with SQL Server, like you are your company's database administrator, or you're a database administrator, or you've got that kind of background, would you raise your hand, please? OK. If you have no experience with databases, anybody here in that boat? That's cool. And I'll assume that everybody else can at least spell SQL. So I think we're good. Just don't consider ourselves an expert. That's fair. Not a problem. So tonight's talk is going to be about securing SQL Server instances. My name is Kevin Beasel. I am a data platform MVP out of the Durham, North Carolina area. And I have a website called Curated SQL. The idea behind Curated SQL is I want to try to find and link to five to 10 interesting technical blog posts per day. Interesting means that it's about database administration or database development, security, the new R, Power BI, anything that's broad data platform space. So again, the URL is curatedsql.com. And I'm going to do one thing that I should have done beforehand, which is turn on Zoom in. Let's make sure that it's on. It's on. Great. That will make this talk much nicer. So tonight's talk, I'm not going to cover quite a few interesting security bits. SQL injection is a talk of its own. It is a wonderful topic. I love it a lot. But we're not going to talk about it tonight. I'm not really going to show you how to be a better application developer. There are books. There are courses. There are interesting talks along those lines as well. But you know, we don't have so much time here tonight. And I won't spend much time talking about logins, users, roles, those types of permissions. Again, good resources are available on these. If you do want to find good resources on these types of topics, the link to my slides, to my demos, and to additional resources, I'll give it to you at the end of this. So let's talk about what we will talk about. And specifically, what we are going to talk about is some features and functionality in SQL Server that help us make it a little bit more secure. I'm going to cover two broad swaths. So broad swath number one is everything from SQL Server 2008 through 14. Broad swath number two, SQL Server 2016. There are some security features that were introduced in 2016 that are very nice. And we'll go into detail on some of them. If you have SQL Server 2000 in your environment, it is unsafe. It's also been out of support for several years. Uh, if you have 2005 in your environment, it may or may not be unsafe depending on whether you ever upgraded to the service pack one or not. Um, but again, out of support, out of compliance, and you really don't get many of these interesting features. So I'm only going to cover versions of SQL Server that are currently under support. We're going to hit a few topics tonight. The first thing that I want to talk about is configuration. Let's get a little bit of service area. And this is a general concept in security. If you don't need it, don't have it. If the code does not exist on a server, an attacker cannot exploit a vulnerability in that code on that server. So don't install features you don't need. Turn off features you don't use. Disable services that you don't use. That kind of thing. That kind of stuff. And these are all fairly straightforward concepts. Like, for example, you have a server that is a transactional system. It's a transactional box. Does reporting services need to be on there? Does analysis services need to be on there? If you go through the setup, you can go like check, 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 let's install all the stuff. And it's really easy to do that, but then you open yourself up. If there's a problem with analysis services, then an attacker could exploit that problem and get access to your machine, even though you don't use analysis services. Now, the converse is, let's say you do use analysis services and it should be on that box. Great, install it, have it there. But if you don't use it, uncheck that box when you install SQL Server. The next one 
comes from the Department of Defense. Uh, they have a set of guidelines to state. And one of these guidelines says that if it's not used in production, specifically databases, if a database is not used in production, don't have it in production. So sample databases like AdventureWorks or like Pubs, Northwind, these things shouldn't show up on production machines. It's not that there are crippling security vulnerabilities in AdventureWorks. No, there aren't any. But the general concept there is, well, maybe that database doesn't have a problem, but it's possible that somebody else's scratch database that you download may have a CLR function which will allow somebody to perform operations on your machine that you would not have expected. And it's a scratch database. It's not going to be useful for production activities. So if you don't need it, don't have it. By the way, if you have any questions at all during this, please uh, feel free to shoot them out. I have a quick question. Then. Yeah. You mentioned the Microsoft, um, the Management Studio. That's Management Studio on the box that the server is on. That is correct. Okay. I just want to make sure. Okay. Yeah. So actually, I should probably <coughs> talk about that for a moment. Uh, a lot of times, you'll see SQL Server Management Studio installed with the server uh, itself. So you'll see SQL Server, and on the same box, you'll have Management Studio. It's not really a great practice. It's preferable to have the client tools on a different machine for a couple of reasons. First reason is performance. If I have to remote desktop into that machine and use Management Studio to connect, well, if I already have a performance issue on this box, I'm taking up RAM that may be useful for the SQL Server instance. I'm taking CPU cycles that might be useful for the SQL Server instance. And the other problem is, again, it's, it's a piece of software that doesn't need to be installed for this thing to function. So if you have Management Studio on your client machine, awesome. And in fact, the latest version of Management Studio, they've completely separated out SQL Server from Management Studio. It's a separate download, it's a separate product. It's no longer bundled in as like a checkbox in the client tools. The next little bit. If the server is not useful, disable it. I have a couple services here that I, I have disabled on, on, on my machine. And I want to talk about them. The first one is the SQL Server browser. So the idea behind the SQL Server browser is I have a machine called Prod. Prod has some instances on it. It may have like two or three instances of SQL Server installed on it. And I have a client who wants to access Prod. This client knows that it needs to connect to a named instance called uh, Prod1. So Prod backslash Prod1. Well, one of two things happens. One of three things happens. Thing number one, it connects to the SQL Server browser. SQL Server browser communicates on UDP port 1434. And that browser uh, gets a request that says, hey, I want to connect to this, this named instance called Prod1. Can you tell me where it is? And the browser says, oh yeah, yeah, connect on TCP port 50408. And then it, uh, the client connects, life is good. Option two, the client specifies TCP port 50408. So prod backslash back, uh, prod1 on port 50408 connects, does not use the browser, life is good. Option three, browser's off. Client tries to connect on a dynamic port. Doesn't know the port number. Operation fails because there's no browser there to kind of do traffic control. You might think that's a bad idea, but in practice, it's really not a bad thing to disable that browser. So if you have, if you just have one instance of SQL Server and it's on port 1433 and you, know, you haven't changed any of that stuff, you don't need the browser anyhow. If you have multiple ports hosting multiple instances of SQL Server, your clients probably should know the port. That should probably be an internal IT thing where if the developer doesn't know which port to connect to to get to this instance, that developer should ask somebody. And somebody external who doesn't know what port number they need to connect to, well, do they really need to be connecting to this instance? If so, 
internal documentation. Here you go. This is where you connect. That way, the browser is not up and running. So this does two beneficial things. First beneficial thing is that the browser is another product that could have a security vulnerability. And even if it doesn't itself have a security vulnerability, the second thing is one request you can make is, hey, any browsers on this subnet, please tell me all of the instances that are on your uh, that are on your control. And so you go to Manager Studio, you that little drop down for browse for servers, and it kind of sits there, takes like 30 seconds to load. What it's doing is communicating across the subnet and asking, hey, are there any browsers here? Please tell me all of your instances. So an attacker who has access to a network will be able to enumerate all your SQL Server instances by hitting a dropdown. That's not a fantastic thing. So if you, say, if you can disable the browser, have people connect specifically to instances that they know, through ports that they know, and have a, a process that will allow people to know where they connect. That's a lot of words about a browser. Uh, the other thing is the VSS writer. So this was introduced relatively recently, and it is a volume shadow copy operation. This is useful for third-party backup software, like if you have a data domain SAN, or if you have some type of uh, device which takes, which will allow you to take uh, snapshots, then you, you want to have this VSS writer on if you're taking those snapshots of the directories that have your SQL Server log files and uh, database files. Otherwise, your files may not, your files will be locked and they may not be in a state where they're fully quiesced. And then you go try to restore and you find out that, oh crap, my MDF and LDF files aren't valid. That sucks. <laughs> but if you're not using a data domain or an EMC product that, that does sand, uh, sand snapshots, or you know, some third-party external to SQL Server backup tool. Sorry? Does it use VSS? Yes, yes it would. So if you're using one of these types of tools, yeah, keep it off. But if, if your backup strategy is, I'm going to take SQL Server database backups, Either through SQL Server itself or through a third-party tool like a like an Idea tool or a Recce tool or uh, something that takes database backups. There goes that. Uh, then you can safely turn this off. And again, reduce the surface area just a little bit. There's a one-liner for PowerShell that will show you the services that are on the machine that are related to SQL Server. And there are some other services that are uh, not directly SQL Server or named, but we can see them like, here's my favorite, the Polybase it's, uh, services. Polybase is something that was introduced in SQL Server 2016. It allows you to connect to a Hadoop cluster. Uh, I am kind of a little bit of a fan of Hadoop. You might not know that from my t-shirt, but. So let's talk about services, as I just mentioned. protocols that SQL Server supports. And the database engine service specifically supports three protocols. Shared memory, named pipes, TCP IP. If you go back far enough, I believe IPX was also supported at one point in time. That is no longer available as a protocol. My recommendation is that probably you want to leave shared memory on. Shared memory is really useful if you have integration services and the database engine on the same server because integration services can read the memory from the uh, SQL Server database engine service and that is a major performance improvement because now they don't have to like, you open a TCP connection. Yeah, to a <coughs> yeah. So that leaves two options, name pipes and TCP IP. I recommend that you pick one and disable the other. Uh, normally, the advice is it depends. And here, yeah, I guess it, it still depends. If your network is heavily built on NetBIOS, 
then keep main pipes on, turn off TCP IP. If your network is outside of the 1990s, then probably you want to use TCP IP. Please tell me that nobody here is using that BIOS as the as a primary driver for their network. Awesome. TCP IP is the recommendation. One thing that you will see recommended every once in a while is take SQL Server off of port 1433. That is the default port for a SQL Server instance. Every tool in the world knows that this is the SQL Server default port. So move it to something else, 50408, or some other very high number. <coughs> That's decent advice, bad advice. Uh, if you do that, okay, cool. But to me, it's, it's not wonderful advice, I don't think. If you leave the SQL Server browser on, then an attacker can find your port just as easily. If an attacker has access to do a network scan of your instance, of your server, they're going to find that port eventually. There's a specific protocol that, that an attacker can use to try to find a SQL Server. They just send the appropriate TES packet, and when there's a correct response, well, this is a SQL Server instance. So, one time when I could see uh, changing your port to make it something else, some strange higher number of ports, might be if you're if you're using Honey ports. Honey ports are a topic that's really outside the scope of this, but it's cool enough that I want to talk about it anyhow. The idea behind Honey ports is it's sort of like a Honey Pot on a network. So you may have SQL Server on, let's say it's uh, port 52,000. I may say, okay, well, if you connect on port 52,000, you'll connect to SQL Server. If you connect on ports 51995 through 51999, or 52,001 through 52,005, I'm going to blackroll your IP address. You're never going to be able to connect to this machine again. Sucks for the developer who forgets what port it's on, but, <laughs> but it's an interesting idea. Or at least I'm going to log this and you know, I'm going to see, hey, if, you, if you've been hit this many times, then I'll black hole you. So Honey Ports is a pretty cool concept. Um, I don't know how many organizations have those actively in practice, but if you do, then yeah, this sounds like a lot better advice. If you don't, <coughs> I, personally, I don't mind having a SQL Server on the standard port. Yes, every application in the world knows about it, but if you move the port, you're really only going to uh, hide SQL Server from the absolute lowest common denominator script kitty type who can't like, change a port. Otherwise, you'll, it's still there. In, in most Microsoft environments, you can enrich your SQL servers from memory. That is true. That is you true. don't have to have any rights for that. True. Yes, sir. Is it possible for unenforced to be detected as well? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Is it possible for honey ports to be detected as well? Can you detect honey ports? Well, I mean, if it's a <coughs> say you have that type of setup where it's, uh, it's really just a roll, a <coughs> firewall roll. Um, if you have an attacker who is doing a port scan and suddenly can't get any response from that server, maybe they figure out that, yeah, you blocked them. Uh, so, I suppose in that sense, yes. But you know, really, what what that is is really just a rule that says, hey, if I get contact, if anybody tries to connect on this port, perform some operation specifically, ban that user, to add a rule to deny that uh, that IP address. So, to answer your question, yeah, probably an attacker would be able to see that, but um, you know, that's. It's still okay. Yeah, exactly. <coughs> exactly. Once once they start seeing individual servers lock them out because they keep doing port scans on those servers, then they may change their change their uh, operation methods. But you know, hopefully by then you block them out of everything good. This is a more controversial piece of advice. Disable XP command shell. XP command shell opens up a shell in SQL Server. So you can perform operations, the command line operations in Windows. My recommendation, 
goes against what you'll see in a lot of places. In a lot of places, you will see people say, disable it. My recommendation is, don't disable it. And I have a couple of reasons for this. The first reason, XP Command Shell is really useful. There are certain third-party tools which make good use of this. Uh, the ability to call scripts, to call PowerShell scripts from within the database engine is potentially very useful. Now granted, it's also useful for attackers, but there are two mitigating factors. First, in order to use XP Command Shell, in order to call out to the SQL Server command line, you have to be a system, a sysadmin. You have to have the highest level rights for a SQL Server instance. So if you don't have those rights, you can't call XP Command Shell. And if you do have those rights, this feeds into the second half of this. If you have sysadmin rights, you can do anything on this server. That includes enabling XP Command Shell. So an attacker who has sysadmin rights can just re-enable it. So by disabling it, you get rid of useful functionality, whereas an attacker who can actually use it can just easily re-enable it and take advantage of that useful functionality for very bad purposes. There's one exception. So I say that sysadmins only can use XP Command Shell by default. <coughs> Don't grant anybody else access to, to execute XP Command Shell. Do that and it's okay. Once you start granting people, that's when it starts sucking. So don't grant other people XP Command Shell access. By default, nobody but sysadmin has it. Just leave it that way. Life is good. Any questions about that so far? I should probably take the cap off and get it right. Yes? So say for example you get a manager like, either on the business side or the IT side that says, I want this person to have sysadmin rights. Okay. What are some nice ways to say no? <laughs> and this is why. That's <laughs> a great <laughs> question so because a manager shouldn't be. It's <laughs> separation of duties. Uh, well, so, one would think. But what are some good questions? Yeah, sure, sure. Sense? What are some nice ways to say no? Okay, so that's a great question. What, what do you do when somebody <laughs> comes to you and says, this person needs to be sysadmin. Well, I don't know audit won't like Audit may not like it, yes. So there may be regulatory requirements. Uh, the first thing that I might ask is, okay, that's cool. Um, what do you need sysadmin to do? And if they say, oh, I need to be able to run this query. Great, let me give you access to run that query. I need to be able to run all the queries. Okay, let's talk about all the queries you need to run. Let's talk about the data you need to access. Well, I need all of it. No, you probably don't need all of it. Um, no, no, I need all of it. Well, sure, tell me like one table in MSDB and I'll let you have access to MSDB. Um, I'd probably go on regulatory reasons. Uh, if, you can, if you're in an environment where you can push down that angle or separation of duties or uh, just making it about, look, Let's give you the rights that you need, but if this database gets deleted, then if you're sysadmin, you know, you may have accidentally done it or you may have purposefully done it, but if the database goes down, you're gonna be on the list of suspects. If you're not sysadmin, if you can only read that data, you are completely in the clear. So possibility of guilt might, might say, oh, I don't want that. Um, you may accidentally do something that takes the server down on the day that you're running all of the quarterly reports. Well, we really don't want that to happen now. Or you, something may happen where you accidentally run a command that deletes backups, or does something that uh, messes with the integrity of the system. So if, if you can push the auditing, the regulatory side, if you can push the uh, guilt aspect, those would be kind of the, the angles that I would try to go down. And if you really need to, yes, I will grant you sysadmin and then take away sysadmin and then grant the bare minimum necessary. Oh, well, you know, there's like special sysadmin. Let me go and give you that. If they can't check it, that's fine. Yes, sir. Uh, how do you check that? By default, you're saying that only, only admin has rights. So what, like you mentioned, that the better guy, he has 
your vulnerability takes over. So that's so it, it looks like it's you. Because you're the yeah. only person with asking rights. Right. How do you detect that? So how would you how would you detect an attacker who Because by default, are you saying that he's he's you? He's you're the only person with having rights. Yeah. Right, right. If, if there is an attack that, that uh, exploits past the hash, or even a SQL injection attack, or uh, well, like the hash should be impersonating. Yes, that's true. Very true. Uh, so methods to detect that gets kind of difficult. Um, that's where that's where I you call it. Causing some behavior on it, it's like ATA or some products that support that. That's true, yeah, or your data loss prevention software may be able to, to track something. <coughs> you might be able to have IP address rules where you say, oh, wait, Bob only comes in from this IP address. Why is he coming in from this external one? Um, you may be able to see behavioral changes here. You're, you're getting into the really advanced parts of security stuff that I don't know how many people actually do, but sounds really cool when we talk about it. Um, but to give the, the short answer to the question, yeah, if an attacker is coming in as your uh, as your login, as your with your credentials, then unless you have the ability to see like IP address logs or uh, operation, you know what what's happening on the network, it's going to be really tough to this to piece that together. Log is going to show the origination IP for the log. This is true. So, so from a forensic perspective, afterwards, as long as he doesn't believe it, long, right? Yeah, as long as he doesn't delete it or like insert in some other uh, arbitrary values, it, it it gets into the the uh, rabbit hole of possibilities. Yes, sir. How do you handle the situation if you get hit by a bus and you're the only system emitter? <laughs> That is a uh, difficult question. If you're the only systems administrator, what happens when you get offered a fantastic job and have to leave that day? Uh, that's better than getting hit by a bus. Um, Yes, yes, and concrete overshoot is for free. That's a wonderful deal. <laughs> Password manager could, could possibly be it, or if you have, you may have uh, one other account that, you know, your... You even have a single account. Assuming that you're able to, but you know, even if you have one active account, your CIO has the account, or company president has the account, or somebody who everybody trusts has this account. That's one possibility. So you have that second person to fall back on. You can't travel with that person. Yeah. Yeah, you keep the same If you're getting that extreme, then sure. Um, yeah, or you have a backup account. You have, you have, uh, Put it in a safe. Actually, credentials in a safe is is a legitimate uh, strategy for <coughs> continuity purposes, Actually, which also helps. But you need this policy to make sure that it never happens. Could be policy, yes. Yeah, so that there there must always be two people who have these rights. Um, it's a possibility, yeah. So there are answers. Um, a lot of them tend to be around redundancy. Having another person who has those rights, even if you're the only active systems administrator, you're the only person really doing any work, you're probably not the only person at the company who's at least trustworthy enough to hold on to a username and password. And then maybe they bring in a, a consultant or they bring in a specialist from somewhere else to take over temporarily. Hopefully. So let's talk about a feature in SQL Server called Transparent Data Encryption. The story behind Transparent Data Encryption comes back to the wonderful mid-2000s. So go back to about 2006, 
2007. And think about the regulatory environment of that era. Um, I come from a healthcare background, and HIPAA was just starting to get teeth at that point. They were focusing on data at rest. So Microsoft comes out with a feature that answers that regulatory requirement, protecting data at rest. This is only available in Enterprise Edition, and it's available in any version from 2008 onward. What this does works best if I draw a picture. So we have a SQL Server instance, and we have some clients on SQL Server. A uh, SQL Server has access to data files, has access to, you know, we have log files as well. Uh, we probably have some backup files. So we have all these files. We have memory. And a client makes a request. The client says, hey, can you give me some data from this table? Well, the client is connecting over a network, so we have the network. Uh, the SQL Server service intercepts that, that request and says, oh, let me check memory. Checks the buffer pool. Says, oh, I don't have that information, so I'm going to come down to disk. And then pull back up from disk and send it back out to the client. Transparent data encryption serves uh, one particular purpose, protecting this stuff in green. We're going to protect data files, log files, and backup files. By the way, that first section we talked about is really all about protecting the service itself. Short, uh, reducing the surface area, hardening configuration. So we're going to hit this spot next, and as you might expect, we're going to talk about data in use and data in transit pretty soon. Transparent data encryption. Have a demo. database called TDE test. I'm going to create this database and in there I'm, I'm just going to uh, create a table. It doesn't really matter what's in the table. Just a bunch of just a bunch of rows. Uh, let's say select star test table. It's just a bunch of rows that have nothing but A's. And I want to note that at this point in time my TDE test database is not encrypted. So from here, I'm going to encrypt the database. To encrypt the database, there's this whole chain of, of process that's involved. The first bit of the chain is to create a service master key. And I can check to see, do I already have a symmetric key that's called MS database master key? The answer is no. I don't have one currently, so I need to create one. I do that by saying create master key, and I can encrypt this master key with a password. And I put in a really good password here. Uh, hopefully it's better, yours is better than that, but yeah, it's okay. So is password where you get password goes? So that where, where that's the password. Oh, inside the... Yep, table. it's in red. Right. Sorry, right. This is the end one. Okay, yeah, it's encrypted by a password that specifies that. And by the way, we can come back and check and we say, oh, cool, this is encrypted with NES-256. That is the best that's available within SQL Server at this point in time. Do I have any certificates? The answer to that is, yes, I have some certificates, but... None of these are really certs that I want to use. I'd rather create my own certificate to encrypt uh, databases. So I'll create a certificate. It's called Transparent Database Encryption Certificate. It has a subject. So if I come back up to Sys Certificates, we can see that it's down here. It's number nine. And it is encrypted by my master key. So when you're creating, is that like a self-signed cert? Uh, Why can, can't I use something from my certificate of already set? So, this is a self-signed certificate that's encrypted using the... So it's not an SSL certificate, but it is a cert that is uh, created 
by the database back to the end. I would have to think about whether you could import your own CA cert. Um, the purpose of it isn't really for external use. You don't hand this cert out to anybody. It's really for your SQL Server instance. So it's not public. Because I see no private keys. Is there ever a private key? Now that one says there is. Oh, okay. So these up here, the MS ones, the Microsoft ones, do not have private keys. But this one that we created does have, it is encrypted by the master key. So yeah, there is a private key there for that certificate. And that's the one that we're going to be using here. We use it, we create a database. So we say, hey, give me a database encryption key. So I created the master key, which implicitly created a service master key as well. I created a certificate. Now I'm going to create a database key off of my certificate. And this tells me a warning message that says, hey, uh, buddy, you should probably back this up because if you don't, you may have trouble later. What's happening is this database encryption key, as soon as I say go uh, encrypt my data, it's going to start encrypting. I take a backup. I'm going to back up encrypted data. And then I take it over to another server that doesn't have the certificate, doesn't have the appropriate key, and try to restore it. And it's going to say, no, I can't read this data. It's encrypted. What do you expect me to do? I have to move over the certificate, put in the certificate, and it says, oh, I can encrypt this now. So this is saying, hey, you should probably uh, back up that certificate. And I'll say, I'll back it up later. Turn off transparent data encryption, alter database, set encryption on, run this, and it's working in the background. For my tiny table, it's already done. It was done pretty much as soon as I hit up on it. We have a large database. This may take a couple days for everything to fully encrypt. Uh, it is transparent, it's all in the background. People can still query this database. There's a performance hit while it's encrypting. That performance hit will be bigger than the performance hit after encryption is done. There is a small performance hit after encryption is done. It's probably, the rough estimate is about 5% of uh, CPU, or about total load. And that's because we have to decrypt data files. We have to uh, also decrypt and encrypt anything that goes into TempDB. Any temporary tables that we create, they have to be encrypted as well when we write those to disk so that our sensitive data user database doesn't get leaked in TempDB as we create a temp table from some of the sensitive data. So there is a small performance hit, but it's a non-zero hit. I can see a couple things here. First, as I mentioned, TempDB is encrypted. Uh, second, my database is also encrypted. So now that these are encrypted, if I take a database backup, and I go over and try to restore it onto some other machine, it will fail unless I back up the certificate. So let's talk about certificate management. I'm going to go back to master and back these up one thing at a time. First thing, I talked about that service master key. So this thing, I back up service master key to a file, I am going to double check and make sure that my files have been deleted because otherwise, <coughs> okay, cool. Otherwise, I would get an error that says, hey, there's already a file here. I don't know what you want me to do. So I back it up and I encrypt it with a password. This is the file password. I back up the database master key. So this was the thing that we created first. And again, its password is a file password. We'll need that to restore, but it's not the same thing as the, the password we used to create. We back up the certificate to a file. And I, I do note that Yes, you can create a private key uh, with a password for the certificate as well if you want to. 
I would take this stuff, I'd put it, if you have a certificate, a secure certificate store, put that, put this cert in there. Don't leave it with your database backups. The whole idea is if an attacker gets access to your drive that may have your backups, they can copy all your backups, but without the certificate, they can't do anything with them. If you have a certificate in the same folder, what's the point? So if we're auditing these servers, we should be looking for not certain not key files. Yes, that would be a good thing to look at. Uh, because dot certain dot key are sort of the the standards for uh, file naming for these types of files. So yeah. I mean I could call it something else, but most likely you're just gonna copy and paste from the same script that I copied and pasted from. So those are called dot key dot So that's what everyone's gonna use. If I'd like to restore, so let's say that I have this key and my server explodes and I have to build a new server and I need to be able to restore these databases. First step, I restore the service master key from file. So it's a file either locally or on a share and decrypt it by password. This is the file password that we used. Interesting message that it gives me. It's smart enough to recognize wait, this is the same key that you've got in place right now. I don't need to do anything like decrypt all of your data and encrypt it using the new key. I can just say, well, you must be testing this or you must have already done it or something, so, you know, to know of. No data re-encryption required for this. If I switched out the, <clears throat> excuse me, if I switched out the key, then yes, I would have to re-encrypt all of the data. And again, you take that performance hit while it's decrypting in memory, Encrypting right into disk, you'll take that performance hit during that time and then it'll go away, yes. Let's see, uh, are there file size con consequences and slack space consequences from encryption? So while you're encrypting, are there is there growth in file or block? Um, I don't remember there being anything significant. Yeah, last time, last time I did this on a system that had very little disk space remaining, uh, it wasn't like it needed to make a full copy of the other file. Um, I don't remember it growing significantly. Although that was a few years ago, so my memory could be hazy and I could just be making that up. Um, I'm probably not, but that's the risk you run. So I have a service key. Now I need to restore this master database key. And we have decrypting with the file password, encrypting with the key password. So I run this script and it says again, what are you doing? I already got this. As far as certificates go, there's no such thing as restore certificate. You can drop and recreate the certificate. But Incidentally, I'm currently using the certificate. So if I try to drop the cert, it's going to say, hey, you know that you're using this, right? And it'll say, yes, I do that all along. And I won't, I won't be able to drop it. The way to drop this, if I, work, if I want to drop the certificate, I need to stop transparent data encryption. And then I can drop the cert. But if I'm building a new server, and I need to be able to restore this backup, I can create the certificate over here, and then I'll be able to restore the backup. So that'll work just fine. Transparent data encryption is a pretty useful part of a security strategy. It helps you with that data at rest portion of securing a SQL Server instance. There are ways around TDE, especially if you have access to the box, because there's there's an interesting article by a fellow by the name of uh, Simon McAuliffe. He has an article where he uh, shows the way that TDE works is it's a, a chain of nested operations looking at different keys that are looking at different things that eventually come down to registry entries, and there's sort of one registry entry that controls everything. And if you have access to that registry entry, then you could go back through and figure out the rest of the, path, the process. 
His argument is TDE is completely worthless. I don't quite subscribe to his conclusions. I think that his article is really interesting. I have a link to it. I highly recommend reading it, especially if you're into uh, if you're into the way that keys work and how how uh, encryption works in the environment. But I think that there's still value in, in transparent data encryption as a way of protecting data at rest. I would not use it as the only method, but it's a method, and it is helpful. Questions about that? You were first. Does encryption only encrypt each unique character that should be developed? I am not positive. So in other words, A has, you know, comes encrypted the XYZ, one, two, three, four, and then B is C. No, this ABS256, as I recall, uses cyclical block chaining. Um, what's that?
not there. Okay, so that would mean that the only place that it is currently until I, unless I put it in there, is it's in metadata here. So it's, it's just it's stored within the database. Okay, so if I'm restoring it, how does it know that, that? So that's why I asked that because you said it knows that it's there. <laughs> So I actually have to do an import first. Yes. So it's in the metadata. Correct. And right, if I'm doing it fair, yeah. Yeah, that's where you would say create certificate. So first, uh, yeah. we we back up the certificate using the backup command, and then we create it on a new server from this file. Yeah. So because I I did back it up, it is right here. And I could import that into um, using search Excel, should it be necessary. Okay, uh, we will break in about one slide. So I highly recommend you use backup encryption. If you have a third-party backup tool, uh, encrypt the backups through that. If you use SQL Server, if you encrypt the backups through that, if you use something like Minion Backup, check that box that says yes, encrypt my, uh, encrypt my backups. Now, if you have a third-party data uh, deduplication engine that you throw all your backups on this device and it dedupes and that way you can keep 40 terabytes of space of uh, backups on a 10 terabyte one, your SAN admin will not like you. Oh. <laughs> Your security admin will like you, so figure out which one hates you more and like, try to make that determination. Oh, which one do you hate more? <laughs> there, that is a good question. So, uh, I guess it's break time. Sorry to mention, we secured the service, or we've taken measures to secure the service. We've looked at securing data at rest using okay. transparent data encryption. Uh, there was also a great example uh, during the break of, hey, use BitBlock or use some other full disk encryption process. So we've got these in place. We're encrypting data at rest. Now I want to encrypt data over the network. I want to encrypt that, that uh, data that's flowing between my server and the client. And we're going to use SSL for that. SQL Server does offer the ability to use uh, SSL certificates, and you have two options. You can create your own certificate, self-signed cert. This is a bad idea. Uh, actually, it's not a bad idea. It's a good idea for messing around, for testing, for uh, maybe a development environment. But for a production environment, get one from an enterprise authority. If you know how to do that, awesome, go do that. If you don't know how to do that, find the person who knows how to do it. If you're the person who should know how to do it, you don't know how to do it. The internet. Stack Overflow Pop, I'm sure. Mr. Google. Exactly. So this set of demos is going to be a little bit different because it's all pictures. I am going to start off with creating a self-signed certificate. These first couple steps, again, if you're in a production environment, you know how to do this the correct way, use it, generate it appropriately. But if you don't, I'll walk you through the self-site portion for lower environment out of production. I'm going to use IIS to create a server certificate. You don't need to. You can create your own self-signed cert uh, using make cert. But if you're using IIS, uh, you have server certificates. You can click on that little facet right there. And over on the right-hand side, you can create a self-signed certificate. Give it a name. My name here is SQL SSL test and that will go into my personal certificate store. You can go back to the server certificates listing and we can see SQL SSL test uh, issued by my machine and it's in the personal store. Okay, from here, we're gonna pretend that we got uh, an appropriately issued certificate. <coughs> so this is the same regardless of how the certificate was issued. Where in the certain store it might be may differ, but the process will be the same. Uh, open up the Microsoft Management Console, add or remove the certificates, snap it. So we'll 
can do that for the computer account, specifically my local machine. You can do this for a remote machine as well. No problems there. As long as you have access, yes. In my personal certificate, remember that's where we created it, I see the one that was issued and it's called SQL SSL test. So I'm going to right click that thing, go to all tasks and manage the private keys. This opens up what looks like, like when you right click file properties, you get the uh, security tab. Well, I'm going to add a user here as well. We're going to add the service account for SQL Server. On my particular machine, it is NT service backslash MS SQL Server. Your account may differ. I am going to give read access. You don't need to give this account full access. It doesn't need to be able to modify the certificate. It needs to be able to read it. Then, back to the configuration manager. So we looked at this a little bit earlier when we talked about disabling main pipes, unless you're in 1998. Uh, so I'm going to go to the SQL Server Network configuration. That, by the way, if you're using Windows 10, they hide the SQL Server, man uh, SQL Server Configuration Manager. It's an MSC that's called SQL Server Manager in your version number. So we go here and we open this thing up and uh, it's over here in SQL Server Network Configuration. I have protocols for MS SQL Server. Well, I right click, and I go to properties, I select my certificate. And I can see the SQL SSL test that was generated. So I'm going to select that one. If I go back to the uh, uh, flags tab, I have this ability to force encryption. If you set that to yes, every connection to that SQL server instance must be encrypted through SSL. By default, it's no. By default, you don't have a certificate. If you add a certificate, you can set that to yes. That's probably a good idea for production if your application is supported. If the apps are okay connecting over SSL, that's a good idea. They probably should be. They probably should be, but you know, sometimes we have like that cold fusion app that was created in 2003. Uh, this is a Microsoft product, so you will have to restart it afterwards. <laughs> so we have a management studio. We're going to connect to this instance. So I put the instance name in, and I'm going to hit a button that almost nobody ever even looks at, notices exists, options. I can see this screen hundreds of times and still miss that options button. On the connection properties tab, there's an option here to encrypt the connection. Check that box. Otherwise, if you're calling this from like a .NET application or any applications using a connection string, the connection string just should read encrypt equals true. And now you're connecting over SSL. And that will secure the network connection transit. Questions about that? Great. It's a really good idea. So, where we're at. Remember the person doesn't use SSL. What's that? Which version doesn't use SSL? Uh, which version of, which version of uh, TLS does SQL yeah. Server use? So which version of TLS does SQL Server use? It depends on the version of SQL Server. And recent versions of like 2014, there was a CU that allowed you to use uh, TLS 1.2. Um, I forget if 1.3 is a real thing or if it's something I'm making up in my mind. The, the latest version could be. I know that the latest um, version of TLS that's currently available, you can connect to it from within any supported version of SQL Server. I'm pretty sure every, uh, like 2008 on, has the ability to use TLS 1.2 or later. So, coming back to this, my terrible images. All right, we have talked about securing the service. We've talked about securing the data on, at rest. I just walked through how to secure this portion. We're going to spend the rest of this talk looking at some SQL Server features. Some of them will focus on memory. Some of them will focus on presentation. Before I get to that, oh, God. this, in case you're asleep, this is a great time
I'm really down for one sentence, yeah, I can go back to sleep. <laughs> Your service account does not need domain admin rights. I'm going to come over here and lean over. I'm going to repeat this a little bit more slowly, a little bit more forcefully, because it is that important. Your server does not need domain admin rights. I don't care what you're doing on SQL Server, you do not need domain admin rights. If you have a web application that has a SQL injection vulnerability, and your SQL Server database engine service account is a domain admin, then an attacker can do literally anything on your Windows domain. That is a bad thing. Let's avoid doing that really bad thing because there's literally no reason. There is nothing that your SQL Server should be able to do in any non-crazy world that would require domain admin. You may need rights to do things like, oh, I need to be able to write out to this file share. Great, grant that. I need to be able to uh, write to local disk. Grant that. I need to be able to create Windows users. Wait, what? Uh, no? Okay. Exactly. Um, that's where you start talking crazy talk. So let's... Can we go also and say there's no reason for it to be a member of a local administrator for the server? So, should, is there ever a reason for it to be a local administrator? Um, I would say no. No, I feel that too. Yeah, I, I would not make the service account domain admin, local admin. Um, in fact, we're going to talk about virtual accounts in a moment. The moment has arrived. <laughs> virtual accounts are something that are new as of SQL Server 2012 and uh, Windows Server 2008 R2 or Windows 7. The idea behind a virtual account is it is not on the domain. It's a non-domain pseudo account. It doesn't really exist, but it has the appropriate minimum privileges needed for this service to run. For example, the SQL Server database engine virtual account. You may have seen earlier I showed a picture of NT space service backslash MS SQL server. NT space service isn't something at all. I don't have a domain called NT space service. It's a pseudo account. It doesn't really exist, but it's been granted <coughs> specific rights because those are the rights necessary for the database engine to run. Now, you might need to grant it more rights. Uh, I need to be able to run out this file share because I'm writing backups to uh, somewhere on the domain. You can grant those rights in Active Directory by modifying the machine name dollar sign account in Active Directory. So if I have a server called prod SQL, it's prod SQL dollar sign. That's the thing that I would modify to grant it the specific right to write to this particular network share. That doesn't, you, that's not domain admin either. You could use managed service accounts, yes. Um, yeah, sure. Um, sometimes a better idea. Could be. Uh, one area where it might be a better idea is if you're trying to build a cluster, because you cannot use a virtual account with a cluster. It must be a domain account. So if you're building a SQL Server cluster, actually I should say, if you're building a Windows failover cluster, Windows FCI, those accounts need to be uh, domain accounts. Cannot use virtual accounts for that. Those accounts should not be domain admin either. You're getting a common theme here. Domain admin is not something you just hand out like candy. It's not Halloween. Halloween is already passed. So, why virtual accounts? The real benefit to a virtual account is that it kind of forces some level of uh, separation between servers. If I'm administering a dozen servers in production, a dozen SQL Server instances in production, I may get lazy and create one production uh, account that the database engines, all 12 database engines would use. And if I get lazy and I do that, then the attacker can come and exploit server number one and have the appropriate credentials to access server two and three and four and five. So I can, the attacker can pivot horizontally across your SQL Servers as long as they can communicate with one another. With virtual accounts, those rights are for that machine. Just because you have rights over here does not mean you have rights on SQL Server Instance 2. That's a different virtual account. So an attacker cannot simply pivot to other SQL Server instances. So that makes it really cool. 
and I have a screenshot here of the different SQL Server services. Noting that anything that reads NT service here uses a virtual account, non-domain pseudo account. There are some services which do not have the ability to use virtual accounts. The browser is one of them. The VSS writer is one of them. <coughs> Note that how I made mention earlier that you know if you don't need these things, maybe you should disable them. Uh, Polybase is one of them. Again, I love Polybase, but running locally, Polybase generally is a network service. Uses network service. If you're using this as part of a scale-out Polybase cluster. We have a bunch of SQL Server machines that are acting uh, this in conjunction with a bunch of Hadoop nodes. You'll need a domain account. Questions about service accounts? Arguments that service accounts should be domain admin. Cool. This is my most controversial statement of the night. Service accounts should not be domain admin. So dynamic data masking is something that was introduced in SQL Server 2016. I'm going to go on a tangent here. I'm going to go to my tangent corner. SQL Server 2016 was an interesting release. But <coughs> SQL Server 2016 SP1, made mention last week, just came out last week. This is the biggest news in SQL Server since at least 2005. The reason is, that SQL Server 2016 SP1 service pack. What's so interesting about a service pack? Well, every development feature that has been Enterprise Edition only since 2008 is now available in every edition. So table compression, partitioning, dynamic data masking, always encrypted, in-memory OLTP, column store indexes, all of this stuff that has been that is for Enterprise Edition only is now available in Standard Edition in Express Edition, in Local DB Edition. So, if you're using Standard Edition in your environment, and I would very, very highly recommend jump to 2016 SP1. Uh, I know that there are companies that, have, that are still on 2008 R2 because they didn't like the licensing changes for 2012. This is a really good argument. If you're at a smaller business where you're having trouble uh, with performance because you know, you've got a stand that's got a bunch of spinning disks. If being able to compress those larger tables will reduce I/O, will reduce your your uh, the length of time that queries take to run because now you're reducing the amount of data that is on disk, so you're reducing fewer reads, so faster results. So immediate ROI for the company. And it's all free. In other words, I buy 2016 Standard Edition, not Enterprise. I, I just upgraded this Q1. I get all of these things that historically you had to pay five times as much to get. So this is gigantic. Tangent over. Let's talk about dynamic data masking again. The idea behind dynamic data masking is you mask data dynamically. Come on, come on. Okay. Thanks, <laughs> so there are a few different masks that are built in. Uh, one of them is being able to mask email addresses. One of them is just a default mask where for strings it's just a bunch of X's. For numbers it's the number zero. And third is random values. You can pick uh, numeric values from beginning to end and it will give you random values within there. You can also build your own custom mask if you like. So let's look at those. I have a new database that I'm going to create called EDM Test. And I have a user called Robo Reader. It's going to be able to interact with this robot table. The robot table uh, has interesting information about the robots that we manufacture and service. And Robo Reader will be able to insert, update, delete, and select data from the robot table. You might say it's a reader account. Why is it able to delete data? I would say stuff happens. Permissions change over time. So we're going to insert some data into the robot table. 
and there we go. Let's. So we have a few robots. One of them does not follow any of Asimov's laws. Ah, ah. So, uh, all right, we've got some data. Let's notice that we already saw, hey, I can see all of this data. We've done the data with mask. So let's create a mask. The serial number, we're going to turn it into a bunch of X's. The number of robot laws followed, we're going to make it a random number, zero and three. That way you run it repeatedly, you'll, you'll never know exactly what number it is. Email address, the kill frame will be random characters and what they dream about. We're going to take the first character of what they dream about, add it with a bunch of X's, the last character that they dream about. So to do all of this, we just say alter table, our table name, alter column in the column name, add mask with the function that we want. We have all these functions available to us. Hit F5, and I select from the table, and none of them are matched. You might say, why? The answer is, I am a sysadmin. Sysadmins see through masks. So, good thing I created RoboReader. <laughs> and RoboReader, queries this table, and sees the number of laws followed is random. Actually, I like this thing a lot because uh, if an attacker does happen, or if somebody's shoulder surfing, and they're looking like, oh, huh, two laws followed. It looks like real data, but it's completely fake. If you have credit card numbers, you can create a mask for credit card numbers that includes the uh, appropriate checksum, but it's actually a completely invalid number. That's really fun if, if your data gets dumped and you know, somebody's like got this data that looks real until they try all the card numbers and they find out that all of them are bad. That is a way to mess with attackers. I don't necessarily recommend it, but it is kind of interesting. Robo Reader. So this classically would be like social security numbers. Social security numbers. Yeah, that would be uh, a valid or email address. Because you do all the stuff for a living, right? All the PII, PHI. Uh, not anymore, fortunately. I got out of HIPAA, now I'm in e-commerce, where nobody cares about any data we collect. I mean, ah! <laughs> <laughs> now, now I get to deal with SOX, with Starbase Oxley PCI. Uh, the fun never ends. But anyhow, RoboReader is going to insert a new record. Uh, we have a new robot that we're going to work with. Incidentally, if you send an email address or an email to that address, you may actually get a response. It is a valid email. And we ask the question, will Mr. data be obfuscated? We just we inserted it. RoboReader inserted it. So RoboReader should be able to see that no, nope, RoboReader cannot in fact see Bender's data. <coughs> but here's where dynamic data masking gets interesting. This is just a mask at the very end of the process. So what if you happen to know Bender's email address? Can I get Bender's record? Yes. So matched. It is matched. But think of it this way. If you try to use the dynamic uh, data masking on social security numbers, so that was a great example, you might say, OK, well, select star from personnel where SSN equals 000, 000, 000, 000, 000002, last in Roosevelt. Um, then you will get C. Montgomery Burns' social security number. Uh, uh, uh. That was a nice episode of The Simpsons. But does um, does a like statement work with uh, dynamic uh, masking? Oh, does a like statement work? That's a great question. Let's execute as a robo reader again. Yeah. So the answer is, yes, it does. You'll get your, your data, your mask data, but you won't necessarily know what the email address was. So if I revert, I can see as sysadmin that, yeah, vendor's data did get successfully added. So even though it's masked at the end, it was successfully added. It is correct in the database. 
dynamic data masking is not really a security feature. Uh, it's sort of a keeping people honest from accidentally seeing data that they really shouldn't see feature. If you want to get around dynamic data masking, well, think, think of ways you might get around it. I have a credit cards table. So, what I might do is create a, a table of all of the valid credit card numbers and join to my uh, credit cards table. And because we can you know, do those where clauses, we can, we can manipulate uh, queries that can see the data even if we can't. If you join to this table, I can get back the credit card numbers. It's not really a data protection feature. It's just protect what's on the screen from innocent shoulder surfing, or maybe slightly malicious shoulder surfing. Questions? Something that is closer to a real security feature, real level security, also in SQL Server 2016, also available to everybody in 2016 SP1. Real level security will allow you to uh, segregate data within a table based on the account accessing that data. So we will create two users, Alice and Bob, and we're going to have a chat application where Alice and Bob are talking to each other. We will store the details of that chat in this message log table, and both of them will have access to modified data in that table. Uh, here's our chat. So Bob and Alice are talking to each other. Bob greets Alice, Alice responds. Alice asks about Charlie. Bob says, eh, he's over somewhere with Diane. So now, let's see how it works. As Alice, so I'm going to execute as Alice, she can see everything. She's able to see her commands. She's able to see what Bob sent. So let's uh, revert back. What I'd like to do is implement a security function where on this message log table, Alice can only see messages that she sent. Bob can only see messages that he sent. So they can't see each other's messages. Kind of silly for a chat application, but whatever. Well, did you write where they said only, let me see the ones where I am was a participant. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Uh, so, so if there were 32 different senders, just so you can see <coughs> Yes, you, you could do that. Or a more realistic example is, I want a salesman only to see data in their own territory. I don't want them to see data in other territories. So they can see their data in their territory, but not anybody else's. That's a more typical example for where we might use real level security. So I need to create a predicate. The predicate's purpose is to figure out, for every row, is there a, is, is the uh, person allowed to read that row? And the predicate is a function that uses schema binding. Schema binding basically says, anything in this function, like any tables you reference, any views you reference, may not change. You can't change the definitions of those. You can add rows to a table, but you can't add a column to the table. So that way there's no monkey business. So we create a function, and it's going to take one parameter, the username. And we're going to figure out, will the current user be allowed to view this row? And we say yes if the username that we pass in matches my username function. So I create this function, and now I'm going to use it in a security policy. My predicate is that function that we created. The username variable, that parameter that I pass in, is going to be the message sender column on the message log table. So now, if I execute as Alice, she is only able to see her messages. 
because message sender equals uh, user underscore main parentheses. So that's the function that returns Alice. If I say to do that, it's Alice. Bob executes, and he only sees Bob's data. So we're good so far. So now that we have the security feature, we have a user, Alice, who decides she's going to see what she can do with this. She remembers Diane's name came up in one of these Bob's, in one of Bob's messages. So she's going to try to do the same thing like uh, dynamic data masking and say, what if I know secret information about the message? The answer is too bad. There's no result. Alice can only see Alice's rows. Even if she knows what the message text looks like, she can still only see her rows. But she's not deterred. She says, I know Diane's name shows up in that message. So I'm going to update that message. I may not be able to see it, but can I update it? The answer is no. She cannot update because she cannot see it. Same thing with deleting. I'm going to run this. <coughs> she cannot delete the message because she cannot see it. So we're good so far. What if Alice tries to insert a message as Bob? In this case, with just real level security, Alice can. So this is not a mechanism to prevent uh, to prevent repudiation. Alice can insert bogus messages, and Bob, by the way, can see the bogus message that Alice created. But, as sysadmin, I can't. That's because my policy said you have to be Alice to see Alice's messages. So if I decide I need to be able to see Alice's messages, I can say, all right, well, if you're in the DBO scheme, if you're a database owner, I'm going to let you see those messages. And I recreate the security policy, and now I select. Now I can see everybody's messages. Could you go up just a few more rows and we'll show that again? Sure. So So what were you looking to do? The uh, security policy, right up above the security policy. Oh, yeah. Just a few lines up. Yeah, so uh, the security policy. No, I just seemed to be the paragraph above that. I just wanted to look at it. Oh, OK. OK. I'm good, thank you. Cool. Any other questions about low-level security? Great. So this is very. This is an interesting concept, but insert statements are not protected. You can't protect insert statements other ways, like an insert trigger. Somebody could get around that, technically. The bigger thing to think about with row-level security is there's a table value function that runs for every row. That can slow down performance on a really busy transactional system that's already overburdened probably don't want to include this. The best cases that I can think about are typically relational warehouses where you have uh, sales territory, where you have categories of people who shouldn't see each other's data. Maybe you have some type of uh, like several customers in a database, and you don't want the customers to see each other's data. That's a legitimate case for it. In terms of um Using views instead of six and one half a dozen of another? So uh, the for a front end, right? You can get there with code before the day. Yes. Uh, summing, summarizing those questions, can't you just use views or application code, like all your store procedures uh, spit out based off of a customer ID or something? Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's what we do. We don't use relevable security at my employer. We have 6,000 customers spread across 700 databases, and so that means that it's a multi-tenant. All of our procedures have, have where clauses that say where the customer ID is equal to this. You could also create views and say, this is the view for this customer, or this is the view for this customer, or you could just, in your where clause, um, where customer ID equals X. Those are other ways of doing this, yes. 
Row-level security just gives you kind of a, an easier method so that if somebody writes a procedure and they come in, they don't necessarily know the right way to do things. They just say select from this table. You don't accidentally expose this other data. So it's an interesting feature that will uh, hide under the cover some of the work historically had to do to get this result. Yes. Aren't you using a lot of resources when you have 700 databases with so much data? Why not just have one database and generate? Uh, short answer is that our, our environment is about 80 to 100 terabytes of transactional data. So we've got it spread across 55 SQL Server instances, 55 servers. Um, we would completely annihilate a server of almost any load. It's a pretty cool environment. I like it. So you have a lot of data for every customer, I guess you must have. Yes. Yeah. We do keep quite a bit of data regulatory requirements, and also uh, just data usability so that we can so we can do our job so that our customers get their stuff done. So last, last thing I want to cover here is always encrypted. This is another 2016 feature. And this is a case where we can start protecting data in use. So you have a column, a sensitive column, really want to encrypt this thing. Not only do you want to encrypt this data, but you don't want that database administrator to see it. Sometimes you don't trust the database administrator, or hey, you trust the DBA, but <coughs> separation of duties requires that this person not be allowed to see the data, even if there's this admin. That's the concept behind always encrypting. There are a couple different encryption models with always encrypted. You can use a deterministic model or a randomized model. The deterministic model will allow you to uh, encrypt the column in a certain way that Bob always encrypts to this binary value. So every time you see Bob, it's always the same binary value. The downside to it is somebody could reverse. If they know that Bob is a very frequent uh, row or value, then they can reverse that. Randomized encryption means that Bob will turn into a completely different binary value every time it's encrypted. Uh, there are inbuilt SQL Server uses a nonce to figure out the appropriate value for that particular row, what Bob looks like. The downside to randomized encryption, so the upside is nobody's going to be able to figure out which one of these records is Bob without knowing uh, key. The downside is you cannot, SQL Server cannot figure out what Bob is. So you can't group, like group by this encrypted column. You can't join this encrypted column to anything. Uh, you can't do a where clause where encrypted column equals Bob. You can't do that with deterministic. But the way I'm thinking about it, for the most part, I don't really want to do any of these operations on encrypted data because that encrypted data is sensitive information. That shouldn't be a foreign key. Social security number shouldn't be a foreign key anywhere. Credit card number shouldn't be a foreign key anywhere. So I shouldn't be doing And I'm not sure that you would need to do distinct or group by for most of these uh, queries where the data is so sensitive that even database administrators should not be able to see it. The application can still see it because the application server has the private key that allows it to decrypt this data. There is a performance cost to it. This is an early measurement. It's from the CTP earlier this year. So I, I don't know what it looks like today. They may have improved. But expect in certain performance to be worse than it was before. Aaron Bertrand had some tests where he saw it was about uh, 1.5 to 2x the, the amount of time to insert a row. And there's a slight increase in select time because you have to decrypt that data. But that those numbers might have changed. It might have gotten a little bit better. Nevertheless, what has gotten better? This is a V1 product. V1 Microsoft products aren't always complete. So 
there's some stuff here that you can't do yet. You can't use this with uh, memory optimized table in memory OLTP. You can't just turn it on an existing column. You have to create a new column and build the data from an application, which makes sense because SQL Server doesn't have that private key. The private key lives over here in the application. And you can't use default return constraints. Again, especially with randomized encryption, that makes perfect sense. There's no way that the database engine is going to know this bar binary blob is really this bar binary blob. And I have a check constraint that says if either of those has the character X in it, then I want to reject it. It can't decrypt those results. So that if the application could do those types of checks. So that's where you have to push on the app developers to get the checks right. <laughs> that's a rant for another day. So this is interesting as an option for protecting sensitive data. I wouldn't use it for everything. Don't use it for a bunch of columns because it will kill performance. You know, like you won't be able to do, and you'll also lose tremendous amounts of functionality if you're doing it for a lot of columns that you don't need to, because now you can't really query on those columns anymore. So use it for the sensitive stuff that even EVA should not be allowed to access. And a little bonus, Box Compliant is a tool that Chris Bell created. Chris is a, he's another SQL Server MVP. He's out of the Washington DC area. And he has a security auditing tool called Watts Compliant. He started this off as building up a set of tools uh, to help SIGs audits. So you run this thing and it'll show you all the problems that you have on your machine according to the DOD SIGs. It's going to expand to include the marginal additional checks for HIPAA, for PCI, for Starbucks Oxley. But he's starting out with SIGs because hey, he's in the Washington DC area and everybody's DOD Let's check out. It is a really simple tool. Uh, I do not have it linked in the code. You're going to have to go download it yourself, but the link is here. And also, it's completely free, as in you don't even put in an email address or anything. You just click the download and it gives you the sort of procedure. Run it on your machine, and we see things like hey, I didn't back up a certificate. That probably is a bad idea. Hey, I have some services that are installed. Are they really necessary? So you can go through this list and see what uh, things are okay. They're like, oh, I use analysis services on this machine, so it's an okay check. It's fine. But um, I may say, hey, wait, uh, I'm only saving six error log files. His check, I believe the sticks uh, requirement says 30. Um, but each one of these also has a link. Here's the link. Each one of these has a link which will show some more details about that error. So you can go there, you can get some more information about that audit bit and see is this something that I need to change or is it okay? Ultimately, it's up to you. But this is really helpful for putting it on a new machine, or when I come in to administer a, a new environment, I don't know anything about it, this will be one of the first things that I run, just to see what this thing looks like. What, what does the server look like? What, who's got sysadmin? Uh, who has rights that maybe they, they don't need to have, at least at the extreme, extreme levels? It's also an interesting part of a regular security scan. Who got sysadmin since the last time I looked at this? Because that happened. Been a talk about figuring out ways to secure a SQL Server instance. You know, there's a lot more to security. And if you'd like to get more links, or you want to get the slides, if you want to get the demo code, if you'd like to get uh, any of these other resources, it's at cs4.info slash on slash secure SQL. If you have any questions at all, please feel free to hit me up by email or Twitter. And thanks, everybody.